Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is dedicated for the speedy and complete refuah shlema of our Rabbanit Chana Farchi Chana Batzima Fega Bezat Hashem should have complete refuah shlema bekarov mamash. Also, the week of Breakfast in the Class is dedicated for the health and happiness of their family and the shidduchim of their children, sponsored by Dr. Habib and Rhonda Manos. Hazak Baruch. The Breakfast in the Class is also sponsored anonymously, dedicated. And the merit that our son should engage in Limud Torah uh, for the Fuash Lema of Rabbi Eli Abani Lal Shimon and Mazal Fortuna, and dedicate loving memory of Ms. Lily Safali Nishmat Lea Batchana, whose philanthropy continues uh, to reach and help so many throughout the entire world. The week of Kobe was sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to good today and every day. My friends, today is Yom HaShoah. Um, we have two more sponsorships, uh, Harun is saying. Uh, sponsored by Stephen Rappaport. Uh, the Breakfast King, dedicated in honor of uh, Rene and Ezra Daba in celebration of the birth of their great grandson Ayah Yehuda, and dedicated in loving memory of Morris Ben and Shalom Alina Shmat, Moshe Ben Tzaravah, his wife Joy, son Mark, and family. Um, today is Yom HaShoah, my friends. Last night we had a remarkable opportunity to hear from uh, Ted Comet. Uh, the recording of that, the clear recording of that, is going to be uploaded Bezrat Hashem today. Um, it was uh, it was really something special. There was uh, so many profound insights that he offered and, and such wonderful, wonderful, wonderful qualities of the person shown through. It was, uh, it was very special to see, uh, to see and to understand and to hear um, what he was saying last night uh, for Yom HaShoah. And <clears throat> my friends, I wanted to maybe just take a minute to, uh, to look at some of, the, uh, some of the things that I maybe feel stick out about, about this concept. You know... The, the number one line that's associated with Yom HaShoah is the word Zachor, which means to remember. And what is interesting is that somewhere along the line, that was translated from Zachor, which means to remember, to never forget, which is not the same thing as remember. And in fact, in the Torah, we specifically find these two things written in contradistinction one to the other. With regards to Amalek, the Pasuk says, Zachor et asher asalecha Amalek. What is the end of the reading of Amalek? The last two words, Lo tishkach. Now what's interesting to me is that there are no words that follow the commandment, Lo tishkach. I want to illustrate that point. Lo tishkach means don't forget. What comes after that? Nothing. What comes after the word zachor? Zachor et asher asalecha malek b'derech shetach b'tzrayim yasher karacha b'derech. All these things that I want you to remember. Don't forget. Doesn't need any explanation. Doesn't need any expression. Doesn't need any elaboration. Now this, these two things that that are they sound so similar. What's the difference between don't forget and remember? I mean, by definition. Not forgetting something is to remember it. So you'd think that those two things are the same, but yet in the exposition of the pasuk of those two ideas, you see that they're not the same. So I want to perhaps take a minute to understand the difference between these two concepts in the Hebrew language, and as well looking at the function of memory and zachor, which means to remember, through the eyes of the Torah. My friends, the Zohar writes, Something remarkable. When it comes to Rachel, who was unable to have children for so long, she's desperate to have children. She begs uh, Yaakov Avinu, she says, please, have Ali Banim, give me children. However that, however that will work. Pray to God, do the mitzvot, figure out how to get me children. Have Ali Banim. Ve'im ayin, if you do not have Ali, if you cannot give me children, meta anochi. Uh, the, uh, the commentators differ- differentiate, you know, uh, they, uh, along two different lines as to what Rachel was saying. One um, understanding of what Rachel was saying was, if not, I'm going to die. And the other opinion is uh, it, that if not, if I don't have children, that I am dead right now. That a mother without children feels like she's not living, like she's not alive. It's a very challenging feeling. It's not like perhaps other challenges that people might experience. Um, a mother who is not mothering does not feel like she's alive. So my friends, this concept um, is illustrated in that parasha. Why? Because the pasuk says, Vayiskor 
Elohim et Rachel. And God remembered Rachel. But to me, what's so interesting about that pasuk is that it's, it, is, it reminds us and with contrast actually helps us see two different statements. And I want to take a minute of your time going through what these two different statements are. The pasuk says, uh, when God remembers Rachel and he gives her children, Vayizkor Elohim et Rachel. And I want to read you specifically uh, what the pasuk says. <clears throat> And God remembered Rachel, and he listened Eleha to her. Elohim, et and God opened up her womb. Now, the Zohar writes on this Pasuk that the reason why it says Vayiskor Elohim and God remembered Rachel is because Rachel had a boy. Now, that's a very strange statement. Says the Zohar, right? Ki banim tiluyim b'mazala, u'mishum ze katuv ba zchira. Since children are dependent on mazal, specifically boys are dependent on mazal, u'mishum ze katuv ba zchira. Therefore, it said to remember. The Zohar asks, what do you mean? Take a look. When Sarah gives birth, what does the pasuk say? Ve'ashem pakad et Sarah. And God remembered, and God remembered Sarah. So in both places, we find the words, and God remembered. But in one place it says, Vayiskor, and in one place it says, Vashem Pakad. Says the, uh, the, what's it called? The Zohar. Ki zechira hu mi zachor. Because the word zachor comes, zechira comes me- remembering. Memory comes from zachor, from the male, from the masculine. Upkida and remembering comes minukva from the feminine. Now you have to realize that this also ties in with another teaching of the Zohar that when Yitzchak Avinu was born, Yitzchak Avinu was born, says the Zohar, with a nishu, with a nishama dinukva, with a soul that was from the feminine side. It doesn't mean that uh, that Yitzchak was feminine or effeminate. But Yitzchak had a soul that was unable to give birth to children. So much so, says the Zohar, and the Orachayim brings it in the parashav the Akedah, that it is only post-Akedah that Avraham Avinu looks for a shiduch for Yitzchak Avinu. And one of the commentators over there asks, why was it that Avraham waited until Yitzchak Avinu was post-Akedah to be able to look for him for a shiduch? And the answer that he brings is, because when Yitzchak Avinu was at the Akedah, it says from fear, when Avraham lifted the knife, the soul of Yitzchak, so to speak, departed. He was so afraid that he lost consciousness. He almost passed away in, to some degree. And when God, so to speak, brought his spirit back, he brought him back with Nishama de Duchra, with a masculine soul, which then meant Yitzchak was able to bear children. And therefore, at that moment, Avraham looked for Yitzchak, for a shiduch, for a wife, to be able to carry on the, the, the legacy of the Jewish nation. My friends, so pikida refers to the feminine. Zechira refers to the masculine. Why is this relevant other than an obscure notation in the Zohar? I want to share that the biological nature of a man and the biological nature of a woman, and yes, those, two, those are two actual things um, that do not depend on how you woke up that morning. The idea of zakhar and nekeva are two actual things. So my friends, listen to this. What does a man or a, ma- or a male contribute in the process of reproduction? The man produces material that will then be transformed into uh, a child. The sperm, so to speak, allows for the creation of a child. The nukva, the neshama, excuse me, 
the nukvah, the feminine, what does it do with that material? It doesn't produce the material that will create. What does it do? It actually receives that material and nurtures that material. Now, neither man nor woman can create a child by themselves. This is not to say that one can do without the other. They are both equal partners in the creation of a child. But the creation of that material happens on the masculine side, and the mekabel, the recipient of that material, that turns that potential into actual, the yitzirah versus the tsura versus the chomer, the form versus the shape, if you will, or the shaping, that's the domain of the feminine. My friends, that is why zechira is associated with zachar. Because when we talk about memory that comes with something, that comes with material, that will be turned into something, that is zachor. Lo tishkach does not produce anything. Not forgetting does not create something. Zechira creates something. So therefore, vayizkor Elohim et Rachel, God remembered Rachel, and immediately we hear about vayishma Elohim, and God listened. He heard what, what Rachel had to say, vayiftach, and God opened up her womb. When memory creates something that was not there before, it builds something that did not exist prior to that memory. That's zachor and that's zechira. Lotishkach, perhaps, my friends, is something else. Lotishkach is a, so to speak, statement. It is a promise to never forget so that memory will be able to serve. But Lotishkach alone is not followed by anything. It's not elaborated upon with any more pesukim. It's the end of the pasuk. Is this clear? I want to transport us from the beginning of the Torah from God remembering Rachel, I want to go all the way towards the end. And the Zohar actually lists many different places where we find that idea of zechira that brings about an absolute material change. God's memory of the Jewish people in Egypt. Vayiskor Elohim, God saw the Jews. He heard their prayers and God remembered. What does it mean he remembered? It wasn't some flash, flashback, thinking back, a moment of longing for nostalgic times. A reiteration of what happened because we promised our grandpas never to forget. But rather, in every one of those instances, the zechira results in a material action. Ironically, the Zohar says that zechira doesn't necessarily mean something positive. Sometimes a person or God himself can remember the evil of a person or generations and do something about that through that memory. But there is no such thing as a memory which is disconnected from an altered approach, from altered action. I want to take you to the end of the Torah, in Parashat Azinu. In Parashat Azinu, the Pasuk says, you know, I want to bear the heaven and earth to bear witness, God says. And God continues and talks about um, the, the justice of God. And God talks about um, the ways of the world and what will happen to the Jewish people in the best of times and in the worst of times. But then the Pasuk says, and this is remarkable, God asks of us to do something. And this, my friends, I think, is the essence of what we are doing on Yom HaShoah. But I think if you think that it's about Yom HaShoah, this is where you learn that this is mistaken. Zechor yemot olam, says the Pasuk. Remember the days of old. Binu shenot dor vador. Study and intuit, learn from the years of generations. She'al avicha v'yadgecha. Ask your parents, ask your father, and let him tell you. Zekenecha v'yom rulach, your elders, and they shall uh, communicate with you. If a person is not asking his father, if a person is not talking to his elders, then he is not remembering what came before. If he's not remembering what came before, he cannot develop a plan for where he or she needs to go. The Torah here, in a certain sense, is commanding us to be historians. It's commanding us to study the patterns. And not only of a Holocaust, and not only of the creation of a Jewish state, 
and not only my friends of Amalekites, and not only of Bavel and Paras and Madai, of all the uh, various exiles that Jewish people have been to, but also for a person's own personal exiles, for the stories that have befallen their family, for the, uh, the circumstances that brought them from one country to another. If you learn, if you understand from all of those things, my friends, then something happens. Then you start to recognize that there are patterns, that a person is being taken, guided in, to certain places to understand those things. Now, my friends, this idea is not my own, but rather it's actually a practice that many people have, that at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the prayers, we engage in this process of ten zchirot, of ten remembrances. Remember this, and remember that, and remember the third thing. And each one of the ten zchirot, I'm not going to go through them now, tries to teach us a bit of history that will inform us as to how we should lead our lives in a different way. I'll give you an example. There's a memory of Miriam. We're obligated to remember Miriam. What is that memory of Miriam? So the Chachamim explained that we learn about the fact that when Miriam spoke about her brother, she was stricken with tzarat. Some opinions express that the, that the commandment to remember that story teaches us about the dangers of Lashon Hara. That even as Rambam puts it, even someone like Miriam, who loved her brother dearly, who only wished him well, who only meant it in a constructive way, who did not share it with the newspapers, but said it only to Aaron, who was say, she said it to someone who also loved the, the, the person that she was speaking about. So the chances of damage were minimal. The chances of thinking badly about Moshe Rabbeinu were minimal. The intentions were pure, and still she was punished. How careful does a person need to be when they speak about another, especially Chachamim? My friends, that schira causes us to live in another way. It produces material that has a chance of the animation of life. That's what zachor means. Lo tishkach. You know what never forget is? Never forget is a promise that there will always be enough information to enable a zachor. I need to, I need to say that again. You know what never forget does? Never forget telling over those stories, making sure that we keep going back to Yom HaShoah programs. That we keep going on programs to, uh, um, to, to Poland. I'll never forget, I've been to Poland about 70 times. And I will never forget, pardon the, uh, the usage of that phrase. I went to, uh, to, uh, uh, Treblinka, uh, to Treblinka. And in Treblinka, the uh, monument is actually something really interesting. There's different monuments in different places and they were designed to help people think. I'm not going to go through the entirety of the symbolism of what's there. But I remember the first time I was there, you walk in, and in the center there's this giant kind of monolith, right, kind of built in the middle. But all around are tombstones. And it looks like a massive graveyard. And in the middle is this big, like, almost like a wall, built in some ways to look a little bit like the Kotel itself, the western wall. And surrounding it are tombstones. And on those tombstones, when you get closer, you start to see the names of different concentration camps. And you see the names of entire cities as if those cities came here to die. Now my friends, that idea that entire cities were interred, that you have names that never will be, or be heard of ever again. And not just because um, people changed their name in Ellis Island, but because every single member of every single person that had that last name was killed. So there's not a single surviving memory of the whatever. And I started writing down the names of people, of families in the, in the cemeteries that we visited in Poland of names that I'd never heard of in my life. I'm a person that has a very wide exposure in Jewish communities, Sephardic, Ashkenaz, right? Uh, uh, different countries. I know a lot of Jews, but I'd never met some of the people that were on these, on these tombstones. I'd never met a Happenfeller in my entire life. I'd never met a Rodzini in my entire life. Those were families, by and large. And that's what the tour guide explained to me. I said, how come we don't hear of these people? He said, in some cases, it's because they changed their name when they came here. 
But in some cases, my friends, it's because there's not a single surviving member. member. And I walked away from that and I was like blown away. And I remember that night thinking about those words because they kept haunting me, what he'd said. It was almost like the pasuk says, you know, the chazal sometimes tell us about a pasuk. Mikra zu omer darsheni. This verse, it says, come learn me. And those words kept replaying in my head. And it was all of a sudden I realized why, that they, were, why they were kind of gnawing at my consciousness. Because they wanted me to realize that there was a profound depth in what he'd said. Again, he, I asked him, how come that I don't hear about a family like this? And I have a list of names that, never, that are never to be heard from again. And actually people at the time took on to say Kaddish for that family because there's not a single surviving member, member of that family. Now listen, my friends. He said, one reason is because their family was wiped, not a single surviving member. And one reason is because when they came to America, they changed it to another name. And suddenly I sat bolt upright in my bed and I realized that both of those two eventualities produced the same result. The fact that they were mowed down by bullets, by miyad esav, or the fact that they came to America, the land of the free, and changed their name to something else. And with open arms, miyad achi, they wiped their own family name off the planet and there's not a single Jewish grandchild from that family. In either case, we wound up with no more Jewish children, with no one named Happenfeller. And my friends, I know from my own family that oftentimes the reason why they changed their name was not because of the glittering promise of America, but it was because of the smoldering lotishkach of the shores of Europe. And they could not wait to run away from a Jewish identity that had brought them only pain and suffering and death. My friends, for so many of those people, it was lo tishkach. But there were no more words after that. Because they lived a defensive memory. But Zachor asks us to live an offensive memory. It asks us to identify our enemies, both spiritual and physical. To look at the things in our life, zechor yimot olam, that have haunted us, that have bothered us, and that have uh, led us to, to dark places in our life. And it asks us to learn the lessons and to wage war against that enemy. The zachor says, go out and engage with them in war because God's name is not complete until Esav is wiped out, until Amalek is wiped out. Are you hearing me? The zachor comes with a mandate. The Lotishkach is the end of a sentence. It's Sof Pasuk. For those that gather and tell horror stories on this day and don't understand how to transform that into a, a, a clarion call for what we will do differently, for how we will act differently, it's the end of a sentence, it's a cemetery, it's a graveyard. But my friends, Zachor is always that way. Vayishman Yishurun Vayivat says the Pasuk. Go back in time. Look and see what's happened. And I'm now transporting this Zachor as an obligation for every single person to study their own history. Now, if I was a drug company, if I was Big Pharma, you know what I would do? I'd look at a medicine that I gave you when you were eight years old and I'd track and see what were the side effects over time. And the crazy thing is that you know what drug companies have to do in order to prove that it was their drug that caused this benefit or, God forbid, vice versa, that caused this side effect? You know what they have to do? They have to create a scientific experiment. They have to differentiate between correlation and causality. They have to figure out if it was this thing or if it was something else. The job of a Jew is to study their life and say, what got me? to my failures, what made me make mistakes and not get sidetracked by other things and not differentiate and not, excuse me, deviate from recognizing in plain truth, hard and difficult truths about the choices that we've made. You know, you look at a big fight that you have in the family and you can blame it on a lot of things. But ultimately, when you remember it in a positive way, Lot says, there's nothing to do. This is what it is. Zachor is, 
what part did I play and how could I play it differently? You have a sin, you have a problem that you can't defeat. My sin is in front of me always. I live with guilt. I live with this debilitating feeling that I'm a no good nobody. That's Lotishkach. Zachor is okay, but what could I do in another way? What material was created by that pain? What energy was brought forth that will allow me to live in another way? My friends, for me, that's what Yom HaShoah does. It tells me that a Jew could live a defensive life or a Jew can live an offensive life. And that's not only true about that specific nightmare that we went through. It's true about every nightmare that we ever experience. And if a person uses the tool of zkhira, then they can actually emerge bettered from an experience than they were before it. You can walk away from a graveyard and achieve and receive the Kotel HaMaravi that sits at the center of this, of this instruction of Zachor. May Hashem bless us, each and every one of us, in our own ways, to achieve our promised land. May Hashem bless us to see Nikom, Nikmat, Dam, Avadecha, Shafuch. Allow us to call out evil, wherever it may be, to be able to be brave enough and courageous enough to stand up to popular opinion and to call something which is wrong, wrong, and to not shy away from it, and to not use politically correct terms when we need to say what we need to say, because otherwise we will be left with no material to change. My friends, Hashem should bless us, Be'ezrat Hashem, to become better and stronger from every downturn that we take, that every yirida should be tzorech aliyah, every downturn and dip should be uh, the necessity, uh, should, be, uh, should create the necessity to rise. Until we've risen high enough from falling often enough uh, that we've received uh, the coming of Mashiach Mehra, the Amenu. Amen. Rabbi Chalanyave.